Uh, our second place winners, um, I'm going to start with Dante DiStefano, and his poetry and essays have appeared recently in the Writer's Chronicle, Shenandoah, Brilliant Corners, Hunger Mountain, Obsidian, the Southern California Review, and elsewhere. He was the winner of the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, the Phyllis Smart Young Prize in Poetry, and the Academy of American Poets College Prize. He makes his living as a high school teacher in Endicott, New York. Let's welcome Dante DiStefano. Thank you to Maria, who's done so much for so many of us, and also to the Poetry Center staff. I'm going to read three poems for you. The first one is called The Orchard Keeper. My father wanted to be an apple orchard. To this end, he spent 30 years tortured by the hum of letter sorting machines, which shuffled neither rain, nor sleet, nor snow, nor hail, until his face assumed the sheen of a red delicious whose sorrow the worm only knows. Uh, the next poem is about Granada, Spain, the home of Federico Garcia Lorca. It's called Little Infinite Honeymoon. In Garcia Lorca's city, the dogs would pull down the mountain with their barking. If the accordion ceased their music, or if someone scraped the glass off the tops of the walls on houses near the palace. But they don't because the guitars still pluck lions from the fountains by the scruff of their manes. And the gypsy women still attempt to extort you with rosemary. A spray painted Buddha winks his blessing from the corrugated steel of a closed souvenir shop where they sell Spanish fans. In the poet's city, nothing is as it was when Ignacio Sanchez Mejias fell in the bullring at five o'clock in the afternoon. No Nasrid ghost stroll the gardens of the Alhambra at midnight. No deep song echoes down from the snow-capped Sierra Nevada peaks. Instead, tourists with cameras and shorts eat tapas and buy postcards in the stores of Albaicín. Despite its ruins, this city seems a backwater, a place where great poetry could never come from, a place more Peoria than Paris. At Huerta de San Vicente, they keep a framed drawing Lorca made as a kid, crayoned on yellowing paper, the house the wobbly shoebox all toddlers replicate the world over, inscribed with the one word, amor, the one word that still flashes out like the red hem of a flamenco dress, cutting the air on the stage in a bar where the dancer matters more than the dance, the audience, and the singer who claps out the beat. Here in Granada, we will walk the narrow streets together, the one word between us, the only word that lasts, sparrowing even from the unmarked grave, sparrowing you at the windowsill in your new dress, a single varicose vein on your bare leg, the promise of many sunsets. The pomegranates will break apart here in a bowl of water in your bare hands. At the horizon where all villages end, we will gather apples from another era. And my wife wanted me to assure you that she has no varicose veins. It's a All right. Uh, the last poem is A Morning Prayer While Pumping Gas at the Gulf Station. Luke 24, 13, 35. Oh my God, I offer you this small moment of attention as I stare blankly at the KFC and the coin laundry across the parkway. 
past the sign that says life one mile at a time. I offer you the debit card swipe, the numbers punched into the keypad, the nozzle lifted, the gas cap twisted off, the lever flipped up, the clutch of my hand on the pump, the rush of gallons through the hose, and the flippant dance of dollars and cents on the digital screen. I offer you what I don't heed, this minute and a half when I am most myself without care or desire as the cars rush by like a caravan on the road to Damascus. I offer you the cement truck that grunts up the hill. I offer you the teenager who blares Jay-Z out of the rolled down windows of his rusty Corolla. I offer you the deserted parking lot across four lanes of traffic and the new pizza place next door. I offer you the bank sign that says Horizons. I offer you the smile of a little boy who waves to me from the back seat of the Escalade about to pull away. I offer you the quietness of moments like this, the lull of the car wash, the lazy comfort of 6.40 a.m. after I push snooze on the alarm before it goes off again. I offer you the wind on my face when I ride my bicycle downhill on a steep, steep side street. I offer you all the hours I don't check my cell phone. I offer you all the minutes without Wi-Fi. I offer you the wish for a world without Facebook, Twitter, Guantanamo Bay, enhanced interrogation techniques, the war on terror, the drug war, the war on poverty. I offer you the wish for a world without the 1%, Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, the DNC, Fox News, CNN, Netflix, Waterboarding, Waco, Abu Ghraib. I offer you the wish for a world without climate change, global warming, WikiLeaks, gentrification, Starbucks, Walmart, Target, and the prison industrial complex. Oh my dear Jesus, I offer you that old Zen phrase, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. And without irony, I offer you all of the moments where life rolls out one mile at a time like the road to Emmaus, where I am a stranger to myself, where your incorruptible body lies broken and risen, where I am unaware and graced by this unknowing, where I am broken and can't help but rise closer to you. Thanks. Reader is uh, also a second prize winner, Abby Murray, um, whose second chapbook, Quick Draw Homes from a Soldier's Wife from Finishing Line Press 2012, is based on her husband's deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan. She serves as director of the Binghamton Poetry Project, which is an after school program for children and senior citizens, and poetry editor for Harper Cap Palette. Let's welcome Abby Murray. Hi. Thank you um, to the judges for choosing one of my poems. I'm going to read this one first. It's called A Poem for Ugly People. Only we are not supposed to know they are ugly. And they are not supposed to think we are writing, and they are supposed to think we are writing about the person standing behind them at the coffee cart, behind them in the elevator, behind them as they compare the price of generic and brand name Tylenol. Always the ugly people are behind us the ones we don't see but can forever identify, whose skin tags are vaguely tick-shaped and hang from the cheekbones of women who learned in first grade classrooms how to spell the word beautiful. 
and pictured themselves when they wrote it, slinging gray loops of pencil around that string of vowels we can't differentiate when we hear them called to us from the young teacher's mouth, beautiful, then ugly, with its trusty noise like gum on the tongue and familiar, every syllable spelled the way it sounds. We learn what ugly is right before we learn that seeing it on the face of a friend makes us cruel. Long before we understand the body is a wrapper, tightly cinched around but not a part of the way we live. Ugly people of the world, I want you to know that without us, there would be no perfect breasts or the shallow dip of a man's collarbone. Without us, there would be no statues parading in bronze through parks or even the smell of sunlight on cedar. When my sister's first boyfriend called me an ugly cow, I wish I'd had the sense to tell him that without me, no one could see a cardinal in winter and know it was a wonderful thing. The way he preens like a beating heart in the blackened plum, and we shield our eyes from the glare of the snow to watch it. deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And I predict that I will be writing about that again in the future uh, many times. Um, this one I actually just wrote uh, recently, even though this happened after his first tour in Iraq. Um, he would bring back gifts for me from people that he was working with, the Iraqi interpreters. They would send gifts to his wife. Um, it was very bizarre, but very sweet, and um, so I wrote this about this. It's called, Your Interpreter Sends Me a House Dress. When you return to Iraq or Afghanistan, you are given new clothes as gifts. The long robe made of goat fur that even folded up is the size of a small desk. The brown turban, the rough cotton tunic, and pants. We have photographs of you sipping chai in these clothes, sitting cross-legged in the sun. Your teeth shine as you laugh with the Iraqi interpreter who sits beside you holding bread in his hand. When you leave, he will be hunted by men who come down from the hills at night in white garments like so many stars crashing into the earth. He will send you messages that say, my brother. He will be rescued by civilians sent to San Francisco to work in a parking garage. On your last day in Iraq, he gives you a house dress pressed flat in a plastic envelope and says, it is a gift for your wife, a woman who accepts gifts from men other than her husband because she can, because she does not yet know that sending a dress to his Iraqi wife would be unforgivable, the acknowledgement of skin beneath her veil. The dress is meant to be worn indoors, orange and yellow with flashes of red, the color of so many explosions I've watched on the news, balloons of flame that float over broken mosques. At home in our dining room, I pull the dress on even though I am ashamed of its slim waist and fussy gold thread. The zebra lame pattern stretched thin across my broad Polish shoulders and barreled chest, the Virgin Mary lying tarnished on a tin medallion under my throat. I am too tall, too wide, and too plain for this dress. Too frank and impatient for its shimmering neckline and narrow sleeves. I feel like I am smothering it. We hang it on one of your good suit hangers at the back of our closet where it smolders and gleams between wool sweaters and skirts, throw sparks of light into our shoes. and head trauma. Cut through the grassy median behind the university parking lot and you will shake loose a cloud of grasshoppers, silver bodies striped with white like sunflower seeds. One of them flings herself headlong into my driver's side door and the crack of her shell against metal 
is only something like the sound of a skull pitched to the wall of an armored vehicle as it twirls above a desert landscape, lands in a puff of sand, is picked over by men whose bones are unbruised, and the fractured bodies are dragged out, carried away, the vehicle left split open in the dust like a rib cage. When the war sent you home, I put my hands in your hair and felt your skull the way I feel cantaloupes at Whole Foods, searching for any softness. Tonight, one grasshopper lands on her back beneath my tire, dazed, accidentally showing me the pale patchwork of her belly. When I crouch, she writes herself, kicks backward into the grass, where maybe her lover is waiting, ready to pat her smooth sides one hair's width at a time, feel for splinters between the eyes. Thank you. Jason Allen is our next reader. He has an MFA from Pacific University. His work has been published or is forthcoming in Passages North, Patterson Literary Review, Contemporary American Voices, The Molotov Cocktail, Oregon Literary Review, Split Infinitive, and other venues. He hopes to one day meet Tom Waits and buy, some, buy him a cup of coffee. Let's welcome <laughs> Jason Allen. just especially cool that I'm friends with Dante and Abby and that we've been in the same workshop with Maria, so it's like family. This first poem is called The Story of My Scar, and I have a scar right between my eyes, which you might not notice most of the time, but when you do, it's, it's really pronounced because it's right there. <laughs> in the mirror, I see my mother running down a dirt road in Vermont. I am a screaming toddler on her hip, my face covered in blood, just after I fell, and caught the sharp corner of a table between my eyes. I feel the need to apologize for every detail of the story of my scar, for that awful half mile, for my toddler lungs, for that solitude of those dense green mountain woods, for being born in that log cabin, for Pop, who had the car, parked at a bar all day, and never apologized, but instead blamed her for letting me fall. When I see my scar, I see my mother running through those woods, a single parent to be, the only parent I would ever need. So most of my poems are really kind of dark and heavy, so I wrote um, this one in Maria's class purposely to write something more lighthearted. It's called Blondie and Me. I discovered sex while watching The Muppet Show. <laughs> when Blondie songs were new on the radio. When Debbie Harry, with her bottle blonde hair, strode out onto the stage. Muppets and humans mixed together in the audience. And she sang, Call Me, calling for someone to call her anytime, to please call me, call me anytime. I'm six years old, legs crossed a mere two feet from the TV. I don't know how to describe what's happening to me, to my body. But I want to call her. <laughs> I imagine this thin, sort of naughty woman is urging me to call her from our wall-mounted rotary phone. She's so pretty, she's so in control. The Muppets all seem to think so too. <laughs> and the thought of her answering when I call stirs something warm in my stomach. And I like it, but it's also kind of weird. Anyway, our date will be a trip to the movies and I will hold her hand while we watch E.T. And she will whisper something adult in my ear, and then we will get married, this woman, Blondie and me. <laughs> so I'm gonna close with this poem. This is the one that uh, tied for third place for the Young Kingsburg Awards. It's called Pop. I'm sick to death of writing about you. Sick of wondering where you've been since you disappeared. 
The day you shaved your beard, you were a stranger in the house, a pale, young, terrifying face. The day you took me to the bar and left me longing for the barmaid in the low-cut shirt, who put extra cherries in my Shirley temples, over-prepared me for the world of girls I would come to know in kindergarten. The day when I pre pretended to be you with a mug of ginger ale, when I slammed it back and choked on an ice cube, you shoved a fist into my gut until the ice shot from my throat and smashed against the wall, and I went from blue to breathing. That day you saved my life. The first day you didn't come home, the uneasy peace. The days that followed, those Sunday afternoons with you. The stranger who read the newspaper. The stranger who chain smoked next to us while the TV babysat. You trained us to remain silent and unseen. The last message you left on Father's Day of all days, when you said you were about to be homeless, I might never hear from you again. It plays on a loop inside my head. Pop, if you're reading this, I'm sorry for how you've suffered. I'm sorry the police and hospitals have provided only crumbs. I've come up empty in my search for you. If you're reading this, you should know your mother and older brother have passed away. You should know I want to forgive, but I'm sick of writing this poem. I'm sick of wondering where you've been since you disappeared. Wow.